Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. So today's topic, uh, we'll be looking at the uh, efficiency factors around slurry. Uh, slurry is an important resource produced by the livestock sector in Ireland. Properly managed, it acts as a vital nutrient that fuels growth. However, poor management can lead to losses to the environment and ultimately losses in profitability. To talk more on this, I'm joined by two Chagas experts in the field of soil nutrition, Dr. David Wall and Mark Plunkett, who will be joining us shortly. Uh, David, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. You can see it's okay there? Yes, thank you, Mark. Great. So David, you're going to talk to us about uh, slurry uh, and how we can reduce uh, emissions from slurry, both uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and ammonia, is that right? Yes, uh, a very important topic. Um, one of the key, I suppose, opportunities to reduce emissions on farm and to meet our, our national and EU targets. I should mention also that we're joined by uh, Pat Murphy, Program Manager for the Chagas Environment uh, Knowledge Transfer Program in Chagas, and Pat's going to be helping us out with questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So we're going to have two presentations today. First presentation from, from David. So David, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, you can fire up your presentation for us. Thank you very much, Mark, for the kind introduction. And as Mark said, uh, we're going to discuss slurry use efficiency today and methods or, or opportunities to reduce both greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions, but also uh, other losses of nutrients from the soil to water and, and otherwise. So um, slurry is a, um, a very important resource on farms and there's a huge opportunity to offset um, chemical fertilizer. So to, to enhance its fertilizer replacement value, um, um, when you're uh, applying slurry. So without further ado, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get into it. So just for context, um, the challenges, I, I know in the, in the first and second seminar, um, uh, Gary Lanigan dealt with, with some of the challenges um, in terms of emissions. Uh, in relation to slurry, um, probably one of the biggest losses of nitrogen is through ammonia ammonia volatilization when spreading. Um, and um, this is a, a national challenge for us. Um, agriculture accounts for up to 98% uh, of the ammonia emissions as coming from agriculture. So um, that means then that agriculture has to take the responsibility or most of, shoulder most of the responsibility uh, for meeting the targets. Those targets, um, are a 1% reduction up to 2030, and then after 2030, um, we have a 5% reduction in ammonia emissions nationally to meet. Um, however, ammonia mitigation can be both synergistic and antagonistic with greenhouse gas emissions, and I'll discuss that uh, further in the presentation. So, um, Ireland has got a, a, a relatively good deal um, in terms of, of reductions, um, there's other countries have up to 27%. However, um, they have other sources of, of, um, of ammonia uh, production or, or emission other than agriculture. And it was deemed to be unfair in terms of penalizing agriculture and food sustainability totally from an Irish context by having such a target. So ours is 5% reduction from 2030. So just uh, to recap a little bit, in terms of the emissions profiles for both ammonia and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you can see in each of the pie charts there, uh, there's many different um, areas in terms of uh, where the emissions uh, originate from. So from fertilizer, from manure, uh, from grazing animals and hard standings. And then on the greenhouse gas side, again, enteric fer fermentation from the cows, um, from the soils as N2O, uh, managed soils in particular, mineral soils, uh, manure management again, uh, limestone and uh, urea. However, it's worth noting that in relation to slurry and manure management, um, approximately three quarters of the emissions are related to manure management in some uh, shape or form. And on the greenhouse gas side, there, there's a large proportion related to manure management, 
uh, adding nitrogen to soils through manure, manure management in the, uh, under, under storage conditions, um, and then manure management in terms of N2O, so um, uh, methane and nitrous oxide. So um, this is very important in terms of what options um, or areas that we can identify with potential gas uh, emissions mitigation. So um, the fact that we know this, we know where the emissions are originating from, means it provides opportunities for us to look a little bit deeper in terms of research and also in terms of knowledge transfer on where farmers and agriculture in general um, can best um, engage here in terms of meeting emissions targets. So first and foremost, I deal with the ammonia MAC, so the marginal Bateman cost curve for ammonia. Um, Gary would have shown uh, the, the, the MAX in the first presentation in this series. And as you can see here along the bottom axis, the x-axis, it's the potential um, tons of, of NH3, uh, so ammonia, um, savings per year. So the wider the bar, the bigger the savings. And then on the y-axis, so the uh, vertical axis, there you can see the cost. So where the cost is negative, it's beneficial, and where the cost is positive, it's costing the farmer to implement the measure. So um, there's cost beneficial and, and cost negative here. If we uh, cut straight to the, to, the, to the chase in terms of where uh, manure comes in here in terms of ammonia management, we know the trailing hose, so low emission slurry spreading, so your band spreader type operation for uh, dairy and other bovines are um, fairly significant and uh, there's a big opportunity there to re re reduce emissions. Um, if we move further along there to the trailing shoe, again, you can see that the bars are wider, um, which means that there's more mitigation potential. And then also you have a, a small bar there in terms of, of pigs. The other areas in terms of um, opportunities for lo lowering emissions from uh, manure management are altered timing for manure spreading. So spring spreading versus uh, summer spreading. So summer spreading will have a higher emission because it's drier conditions, and more sun, um, et cetera. And we'll discuss that a little bit further. And then slurry additives. So to amend the slurry during storage, so over the winter, um, to bind up that ammonium nitrate so that it's not lost um, later on um, during storage when, it, when you're agitating, but also when you're spreading later in the year. So those are the, the, the main areas. So you have your, your altered timing, you have additives during storage, and then at spreading, you have low emission slurry spreading. If we look at potential management solutions for lowering more, uh, ammonia emissions, and I have these um, ranked in terms of their uh, ammonia abated, you can see there protected urea, so switching can uh, to protected urea, or 50% of can to protected urea, has the largest um, mitigation um, uh, potential or, or ammonia abated. Um, low emission slurry spreading uh, comes in next, both for the dairy and for the non-dairy, at 2.7 and 1.7 kilotons of ammonia, uh, respectively. And then altered timing, so spreading in the spring rather than spreading in the summer um, for both dairy and non-dairy slurry uh, comes in next. If we look at all the measures or all the areas uh, for improvement uh, concerning slurry, you can see you have your low emission slurry spreading and altered timing as I've uh, discussed. Covering uh, slurry stores uh, for pigs in particular, but also for uh, overground cattle slurry stores, and then amendments or additives uh, are also an option there to reduce emission and uh, we can get credit uh, for all those. The other areas then are increased nitrogen use efficiency and reducing crude protein, um, both in pigs and in, in dairy rations. So um, the amount of protein that goes in, if it's higher, we end up with more nitrogen excretion out the um, the back end of both pigs and um, bovines. And David, if we look at the cost per measure or cost per kiloton of uh, 
ammonia abated there, by far the, the timing, according to your previous graph, is, are, are, are the cheapest way of achieving that, is that right? Yes, so um, the timing um, is, is certainly cost beneficial. Um, we increase nitrogen use efficiency by using the slurry earlier in the year because there's more grass growth, there's more demand for that nitrogen and there's less losses. So it's actually beneficial for a farm uh, to, to do that and he can offset some of his expensive chemical fertilizer bill. The one issue with altered timing is verification on the farm. So it's not easily verified um, in terms of keeping a paper trail or keeping records of when slurry was spread. So um, in those audits, uh, it's, it's a measure that we would have concern over verification. But certainly from an agronomic standpoint, farmers should be practicing earlier spreading uh, to enhance the use efficiency and to um, potentially offset chemical fertilizer. Okay. Thanks for that, David. Okay, so in terms of the greenhouse gas, Mac, so our greenhouse gases are um, uh, methane coming from the animals and coming from stored slurry, nitrous oxide coming uh, from managed soils, so where you put nitrogen sources into soils, especially under wet conditions, they can be denitrified and the gas is a greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide. And then thirdly is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide um, originating from soils and soil organic matter, from transport and diesel and power, uh, power usage, etc. But by far the two bigger ones um, in agriculture are nitrous oxide from managed soils and methane emissions uh, from uh, bovines, um, from ruminant animals, should I say, and uh, from, from slurry. So, um, these are the two, I suppose, ones that we need to be uh, concerned about and we need to look for opportunities to reduce. So again, I've highlighted here with the red arrow, the low emission slurry spreading. Yes, it's costly. However, it provides a good uh, deal of, of, of mitigation. Fertilizer type, obviously changing to protect the urea, uh, provides a, a, um, a, a big uh, change there uh, away from can and then improving the efficiency of your dairy cows, dairy EBI, um, uh, is also a big factor in there. So again, uh, slurry amendments do appear here in terms of the greenhouse gas MAC. They have an opportunity to reduce um, uh, ammonia emissions at, at spreading. And um, I'll just clarify that ammonia emissions, uh, although we're not, green, not a greenhouse gas, uh, are deposited back onto the soil and are a nitrogen source that can be denitrified. So um, we must reduce ammonia emissions to get the benefits from um, greenhouse gases as well. So again, I've summarized the uh, potential mitigation management solutions. This is for lowering the agricultural emissions. So I haven't dealt with the land use uh, change emissions, so such as forestry, etc., or I haven't uh, dealt with the uh, power and uh, fuel uh, ones. But these are, are ones that are, are related to agricultural management of soils and of animals. And you can see there the soil and management mitigation options uh, give a potential mitigation of over 1.2 um, megatons of CO2. Um, in terms of ranking, protected urea is up there, draining wet mineral soils. Um, low emission slurry spreading is coming in third. Um, nitrogen use efficiency, obviously, and extended grazing, the inclusion of clover, and slurry amendments also appears here. So if we look at the two uh, concerned with management of slurry, we can see there that they're, they're, they're significant and it's low emission slurry spreading comes first and then amendments or additives to slurry um, is the second one. Also, it must be noted at the bottom there, animal performance, including, uh, in, including increased EBI, in, in increased animal health and increased genetic merit of the animals and, and feed use efficiency uh, contribute a significant proportion to reducing um, emissions on farms as well. So just some of the science behind this. So losses uh, from slurry, so 
nitrogen losses in particular and ammonia losses um, depend on soil and climatic conditions. So at the time of spreading, uh, it's important to have uh, suitable climatic conditions to minimize um, um, volatilization and nitrogen loss. So ammonia emissions increase in dry, sunny, windy weather. So if we think about when the, the majority of slurry was spread in the past, it was probably spread after first cut silage onto bare stubbles um, in the summer. This is probably uh, the worst case scenario in terms of emissions because you have no grass cover uh, to protect the slurry uh, and you have uh, dry soils with warm climatic conditions. The majority of end losses occur within 24 hours after application, so it's really important to have uh, suitable weather at the time of application and for the, the, the following day. If we look at some of the science, the effect of season on potential uh, ammonia volatilization or nitrogen loss, um, you can see there on the x-axis, on the vertical axis, it's slurry nitrogen loss, the percentage of total ammonical nitrogen applied. And on the, um, uh, sorry, on the, the y-axis, on the x-axis there, you have the months of the year. And these studies were conducted uh, both in Ireland and, and uh, abroad, um, and I'm summarizing these. And you can see there, typical slurry end losses are higher in summer. Just as I've said, the weather conditions are usually not suitable, and uh, they're conducive for higher losses. So we need to avoid or be very careful when we're spreading during this period of the year. And you can see there, the early part of the year, we get much lower losses. If we look at the science in terms of reducing uh, ammonia losses using low emission slurry spreading, less uh, slurry application method is what I'm showing here. Again, on the y-axis, we have ammonia losses, the percentage of, of total ammonic nitrogen applied. And then we have hours ap after application along the um, x-axis. And you can see there the dotted line for the trailing shoe, the low emission slurry spreading method versus the splash plate, um, you can see there, there's a, a significant reduction, um, almost half uh, the emissions um, with the low emission slurry spreading in, in, in total. However, it must be noted that these emissions are happening certainly within the first 24 hours, but probably within the first six to 12 hours. So the time at application is really important and uh, the weather conditions and uh, method are also important. In this example, the trailing shoe reduced emissions by 36% compared to the splash plate on average. Uh, work that was conducted at uh, Johnstown Castle and County Wexford and a number of other sites. And if we look at other studies, total ammonia emission reduction of up to 65% were found in other studies using low emission story spread. So, the higher the loss potential the day that you're spreading, the, 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 the bigger the reduction when you're using less. And then finally, nitrogen fertilizer replacement values, which is uh, the important agronomic parameter. Um, I have summarized four um, application methods. So the traditional uh, splash plate method, the dribble bar or band spreader, the trailing shoe, which puts the slurry, parts the grass, and puts it down on the soil surface. And then shallow injection, which is not used um, uh, very, very much in this country. However, it is used in other European countries, and it creates, the disc creates a shallow slit um, about an inch or so uh, deep into the surface of the soil, and the uh, slurry is injected into that. So again, it's reducing the surface area uh, compared with the splash plate and the other two methods. If we look at the ammonia abatement, uh, obviously the splash plate is your control treatment, so uh, there's no ammonia abated, that's what we're comparing the others against. The band spreader or dribble bar reduces ammonia emissions by 30%, trailing shoe 60%, and shallow injection up to 70% uh, on average. And if we look at the slurry availability uh, at application there, we can see there you get 27% of the nitrogen that you're applying being available with a splash plate, and that grows to 35, 40, 43, 
and 46% with the three other methods, with the low emission methods. So you can see there, there's significant increase in slurry delivery and slurry availability for the, the crop or for the grassland. And if we think about it in terms of nitrogen savings, uh, for a, uh, 11 meters cubed of cattle slurry or a thousand gallons of cattle slurry, you're getting seven kilograms of nitrogen um, applied in that, in that thousand gallons with the splash plate, nine with the dribble bar, up to 11 with the trail and shoe, and 12 with the sh shallow injection. So we're almost doubling uh, the nitrogen uh, availability in the slurry as we go from the broadcast method, the splash plate, up to the shallow injection. And if we look at that in economic terms, um, in terms of being able to offset some of the chemical fertilizer, um, that's worth six euro for the, for the, the um, splash plate. Uh, for the trail and shoe, it's 940 and up to 1020, 10 euro 20 for the shallow injection in terms of uh, the extra recovery of nitrogen. So again, well worth it in the economic terms, well worth it in terms of nitrogen use efficiency, and uh, as well as getting the agricultural and agronomic efficiency, we're also getting reduced emissions and increased environmental performance. Finally, okay, we're going to have to ask you to, to speed through the last uh, slide just to give yeah. Mark time to, to present yeah. his, his paper. That's great. So synergies and antagonisms are very important here. So we don't want to be pollution swapping by doing the best for one thing and then increasing the emissions on um, another emission. So ammonia versus greenhouse gases, reducing ammonia emissions will reduce indirect into O emissions. So as I said, that ammonia is redeposited, it falls back down in rain um, uh, onto the soil and is a source for into O emissions. So you get the, the, the double benefit. Um, alter timing and technique for land spreading, so low emission slurry spreading and spring spreading of manures can increase direct N2O emissions. So again, by putting more nitrogen into the system, it's really important here that we uh, subtract that nitrogen from our chemical nitrogen inputs. So we make a, a chemical nitrogen saving so that we become efficient. If not, we're putting out the same amount of nitrogen and we have more nitrogen present, so we increase the amount of nitrogen. Uh, low emission slurry spreading and spring spreading of manures will reduce ammonia, but also total N2O emissions, so you get a double positive there. Reducing crude protein in the animal diet will reduce N2O emissions and ammonia. However, it has limited application where animals are at pasture. So again, um, we can control where uh, those excreta are deposited. And again, it's, it's really important in terms of the slurry stored in the, in the shed, but um, we, we, we need to manage uh, what happens out in the field a little bit better as well. Slurry amendments or acidification added during manure storage will reduce both methane, greenhouse gases, and ammonia from slurry storage. So again, you get a benefit there in terms of using amendments. So that's it, Mark. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions later on. In, after yeah, Mark. we'll take questions just after, at the end of Mark Plunkett's presentation. So um, we're going to invite uh, Mark to join us. Mark, can you hear us there? Hello, Mark. Yes. Yes, can you hear you? great. great. Um, just uh, it, we we get you to to get your presentation up and running. Okay. okay, so I'm, I'm going to focus on all three major nutrients in terms of utilizing um, um, slurry um, on farm. So, um, like slurry, it's, it's an organic, on farm produced organic fertilizer, and it can effectively replace a portion of chemical fertilizers on farm. So, when we buy fertilizer, we know what's in it in terms of NP and K. Like, for example, we buy 18612, 1020, 0730, we know the level of, of NP and K in the fertilizer. So we need to think about, I suppose, slurry in, in the same light. We need to look at fertilizer replacement value of slurry. So what I have in the table on the left-hand side there is that I have the available NP and K for typical cattle slurry at a dry matter of 6.3%. So there's a, there's a kilogram of available nitrogen, there's half a kilogram of, of phosphorus, and 3.5 kilograms of potassium. Um, and they're all available nutrients. It's also important to consider um, 
you know, factors that affect the nutrient content of slurry, getting back to our bag of fertilizer, actually what's in it. So probably one of the biggest factors on farm there is actually dilution, the amount of water, like how much water is entering uh, that slurry tank, say from milk washings or yard washings. And there can be a big variation in there um, affecting the NPK content of the slurry. We can measure um, slurry nutrient value on farm, something like a slurry hydrometer. It's just a matter of getting a sample of agitated slurry, dropping in the slurry hydrometer into a graduated cylinder of slurry and measuring off the slurry dry matter. So if we look at the impact of dilution on the nutrient value of slurry, so as we go from a 2% dry matter up to a 7% dry matter, the nutrient content increases for NP and K. Like for example, if we take first cut silage, that gets uh, 33 cubic meters of cattle slurry per hectare. If we use a 4% uh, cattle story, we are under fertilizing that crop in terms of P and K to the, the tune of 40 to 50 percent. However, if we use a good quality story like at, at 7 percent dry matter, we are supplying the you know the, all, all the phosphorus and, and the, you know 120 kilograms of potassium. So, my point here is that you know it's very, very important to fertilize your silage crop with a sufficient amount of P and K in order to get efficient use of that nitrogen that's in the story and also bag fertilizer in. Okay, to look a little bit closer at the nitrogen and slurry, um, you know, there's a 50-50 split there between organic N, um, you know, which is not fully available, but becomes available during the, the growing season. What we're mainly interested in is the mineral N. Half of the mineral N is it's the same as urea N, it's ammonium N. Ammonia N is it's plant available, um, you know, during the growing season. But there is a risk of loss around time of application, as David has referred to. So things like timing of application, weather conditions and application method have a big um, impact on the amount of ammonia recovered during and after application. Like the recovery from nitrogen can range anything from 15 to 40 percent. Like for example, if you take a, a splash plate, the summer application will get about 15 percent of the nitrogen recovered, while if we move to a trailing shoe with a spring application, we're getting about 40 percent of that nitrogen recovered. I suppose the next question that we need to uh, ask or, you know, in order to, to make the best use of, of cattle slurry, where should it be spread on the farm to, to utilize the NP and K in that slurry? So if we look at the nutrient profile of cattle slurry, 80% of the nutrient is actually P and K, and that's mainly potassium. So ideally that should go back to the silage ground. The slurry should be returned to the silage ground where it came from. So again, we, we look at soil analysis, take the fertilizer plan into, into account, and the crop that has the biggest demand for P and K on the farm, and that tends to be grass silage. It's also important to make the adjustment based on slurry dry matter, you know, to ensure that we're maintaining the, the P and K balance in the silage areas um, on the farm. Okay, in terms of reducing nitrogen losses, um, probably one of the most important, I suppose, things is, is the time of application. So we're looking at, at a spring application, you know, when, when there's the biggest demand for, for, for nutrients during the growing season, and especially nitrogen, we're talking March, April time as we're heading into peak grass growth, that's where we're going to get the, the, the maximum recovery of that nitrogen. Also, we'll have the, the weather conditions that are conducive to recovering, you know, and reducing ammonia loss in, in that part of the growing season. Our target there is to have 75% of the slurry applied by the end of April. Also, weather is a big, big factor, especially with, with uh, splash plate application, that weather conditions are all important. Like to reduce ammonia loss, we're looking at cool, damp, overcast, and even misty conditions. And that's what we generally get in the springtime of the year. So, you know, it is the greatest time of the year to utilize the nitrogen from a, a demand point of view and also a recovery or reducing that ammonia loss. Again, we should avoid conditions like what we've had in the last you know, six, eight weeks. You know, it's very warm, it's dry, bright sunny days. They are the conditions that are favorable to the loss of ammonia, especially with a uh, splash plate um, application. Like the trailing shoe or the low emission technologies sort of remove the weather element to a degree or you know, reduce the losses um, you know, um, during, um, say, unfavorable conditions in terms of um, uh, ammonia loss. Okay, if we move on to um, application techniques, so again, this is probably the most effective way to reduce ammonia loss is both during and after application. 
Like if we take a splash plate and we're spreading a film of slurry, we're increasing a surface area and we increase the risk of ammonia loss to the atmosphere. Also, if we look at the nitrogen recovery, you know, for a splash plate there, spring application, we're looking at 0.6 to a kilo per cubic meter. That's the amount of nitrogen that's recovered through splash plate and application. If we move to something like a dribble bar, again, you know, again, you have a boom on, on the back of the spreader, the, the slurry is piped out and you're reducing the surface area and it's just up above the grass canopy. There's a significant reduction in ammonia emissions from, with the dribble bar or the band spreader. You're looking at, you know, about 30% rate of reduction compared to the splash bed. And the figure there is about 0.8 a kilo of N per cubic meter for uh, slurry that's dribble barred um, in the springtime. If we look at uh, the trailing shoe technology, so again, it's a, a, a slightly different um, piece of apparatus in terms of that you have a, a shoe uh, fixed to a, a metal bar, there's downward pressure. The trailing shoe is getting very, very close to the ground. It's getting under the grass canopy. And it's very like, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very like the placement of fertilizer or the placement of, of slurry right in the zone where it needs to be utilized. And again, you're getting a further efficiency in terms of reducing ammonia emissions, increasing uh, in recovery, and we're talking about a kilo of, of N per cubic meter. So again, it's a step up on the dribble bar and an improvement um, of about a 20% you know, reduction in, in ammonia emissions with the, the trailing shoe. There's also other added, I suppose, benefits or advantages to the, the low emission technology. So again, you have less con contamination compared to the splash pit. Also, you have a more precise um, distribution or application of nutrients across the spread weight. And I suppose one of the big benefits there that, um, you know, over the last number of years is the increased flexibility. You can spread slurry into higher grass covers, you know, without the contamination and a, a quicker return to grazing with the likes of your band spreader or your trailing shoe. And also it's given you a wider window of application, especially in the springtime when soil conditions, you know, um, can be tricky. So you can pick the, I suppose, the best time from a, a soil traffic, trafficability um, point of view. Okay, so if I just try to bring it all together in terms of fertilizer replacement value or maximizing um, the nitrogen that, that, that's in that slurry in terms of, um, you know, providing more nitrogen in terms of grass production. So if we take the example where we've cattle slurry applied at 33 cubic meters per hectare by splash bait in the summer, compared to trading shoe application in the springtime. So our summer application of the splash plate, we're only recovering 10 kilograms of that nitrogen. Where if we move to a, a spring application with a trading shoe, we're recovering 33 kilograms of nitrogen. So there's an extra 23 kilograms um, of nitrogen there to be recovered or you know, made available for, for grass production. And that's worth about 20 euros per hectare. Another way of looking at it, I say this, this example here is for first cut silage. It has a requirement of about 100 to 125 kilograms of, of N per hectare. So we can supply a third of that crop's nitrogen requirement with cattle slurry. So there is a big savings there, um, both in terms of um, you know, the need to purchase uh, chemical fertilizer in the form of uh, say urea or canned fertilizer. And also there's a savings there as well in, in terms of um, um, uh, reduce fertilizer cost. Okay, so to pull it all together, so again, in terms of planning slurry applications and, and making decisions around how to use that slurry as efficiently and possible, as efficiently as possible, both from a nitrogen point of view, a P and a K point of view, there's four questions we need to ask. The first question is where do we apply it? So again, we apply it back to the silage ground. That's where it has come from. That's where there is the biggest demand for nutrients. And that's where we're going to get I suppose the, the, the most efficient use of the NP and K in that slurry. The second question we need to ask is when do we apply it? And spring is best. The springtime of the year is the best time to apply that slurry in terms of utilizing the nitrogen and reducing the ammonia loss and basically making more nitrogen available and um, you know to grow grass in the soil. The third question is how do we apply it? So again we're looking at a, a low emission technology, something like a band spreader or a trailing shoe. The technology has advanced and is advancing every day um, in terms of its workability and in terms of what it, what, what it does in terms of placing that slurry you know, as close as possible to the target where it's needed for the grass to utilize it and also to reduce the loss of um, ammonia through volatilization. 
And the final question then is, is, is basically the rate or what's in my thousand gallons of slurry or what's in my bag of fertilizer. And it can vary, you know what I mean? If it's low dry matter, it could be something like a, a 4 to 15, which is worth about eight euros per thousand gallons, where a typical cattle slurry is something like a 9, 5, 32, and it's worth about 25 uh, euros per thousand gallons. Okay, Mark, that's... that's, that's great, Mark. Um, Thanks for, for the, the practical uh, insight there. Um, so we'll just we'll pull David in again, and uh, we'll ask you to maybe to stop sharing your screen if you can. Um, lots of excellent questions coming through here at the moment. Um, so just while you're, you're getting set up there, um, quite a few. Uh, David, can you hear me okay there? Yes, yeah. David, a lot of questions coming in around the addition of biochar. Um, could you comment on that? Yeah, it's a okay, so so but, but there's been a lot of research done um, on biochar. So biochar is is pyrolyzed um, plant material or organic matter, um, which increases its surface area and also increases its uh, cation exchange capacity. So basically, uh, biochar has a huge capacity uh, to um, to hold and retain nutrients. Um, so in this context, biochar has the potential to bind uh, ammonic and nitrogen and phosphorus potentially in the, um, in the soil. Um, however, the practicalities of, of getting enough biochar to spread across a farm um, may be limited somewhat. So it's all right for, for smaller areas or for garden areas to improve the soil conditions if they were damaged previously. However, large-scale biochar um, production and application is probably not as practical. Pat, uh, you have some questions coming through there too. Yeah, uh, question for Dave from Harold Kingston. David, uh, what time of year was the nitrogen uh, abatement of the different spreading methods calculated? Uh, remember seeing data showing spring splash bait uh, equal to somewhere less. So those are, those are average um, across uh, a three year study uh, where there was multiple applications over the, the three years. Uh, so they do cov cover uh, spring uh, in terms of low emissions uh, potential and summer high emissions potential. So they're the averages for the methods. However, Harold is uh, quite right that um, the potential uh, emissions with a splash plate are a lot lower in spring. However, uh, they still, the potential is still higher than it would be for a low emission slurry spreading technique uh, in spring also because you're minimizing the surface area. So if you think about the splash plate, it splashes and covers the entire surface of the ground. And then as sun and wind bakes that uh, out, you get more of an emission. Whereas the low emission slurry spreading puts the um, slurry down onto the ground under the canopy, potentially, and leaves it in a very, in a line, which is a, a much smaller surface area. Okay, and the, another question there, does the time of day you spread make any difference? And can you reduce the, the level of sorry being uh, delivered by the spreader uh, and is this of any benefit? Well, I'm quite sure the second yes. the, the, the time of day does uh, make a difference. So if you're spreading in, um, in the morning, so 10, 11 o'clock, going into the peak of the day in terms of sunshine, et cetera, you're going to increase emissions. However, if you were to spread in the evening, where it's dull, uh, less sun, et cetera, you would have lower emissions potential. So um, the, the options there in terms of the spreader, one is rate, but the other one is dilution, as Mark has quite, um, quite elegantly uh, demonstrated there. Dilution uh, means that you have better infiltration of the story. It's not stuck on the surface. It'll actually move into the soil when it's more dilute, and you increase the nitrogen use efficiency. A question here for Mark uh, in relation to the uh, compaction risks associated with trailing shoe and I suppose larger tankers in general being used on the land. Uh, has there been any work or is there any impact that you've observed uh, from, from this, these types of systems? 
Yeah, you, you are, it, it is heavier equipment, Mark. And I suppose you're, you're trying to pick your, your opportunities. You're trying to make sure that land is in good condition to reduce the risk of soil compaction. Um, yes, there was work done in Johnstone Castle, David. I know there was a study done there by, was it uh, Sarah Vero? Yeah. So, any so, to that yeah so, so, so basically that showed that with heavy slurry equipment, that the soil moisture deficit, so the moisture level of the soil was the big factor um, leading to compaction risk. So when the soil moisture deficit was at or near saturated, the risk was much higher, which stands to, to reason it's, it's very logical, compared with when the soil moisture deficit was below 10 millimeters. So when the soil is drying out, uh, hitting a soil moisture deficit of below 10 meters. Metairn um, um, publish soil moisture deficits in terms of their forecasts and that kind of thing regionally. Um, it's How often is that published, David? What's that? How often is that soil moisture? Uh, weekly. Weekly. It's, yeah. if, if you look up Metairn, you'll see that the current soil moisture deficits, especially here in my area of the, of the country in the southeast, are growing and we're going to hit probably 60 millimeters of a deficit this weekend. If we don't get rain, so again, getting very. There was yeah, Pat, go ahead there. Yeah, no, there's a, a question in relation to uh, I suppose dribble bar in particular, and in in dry conditions, leaving uh, lines and trails of of, of slurry and and uh, dealing with this issue. Is it a significant issue, or uh, is it something that that uh, can be dealt with? Um. In dry conditions, and we especially saw it in 2018, where uh, farmers were using the, the, the dribble bar, there were lines of slurry, especially um, slurry that was spread prior to closing for silage with a dribble bar. Um, that manifested itself that those lines actually dried out in the fields and caked on the surface and were present. There wasn't enough rainfall to actually wash them in and incorporate them into the soil and they were there at, at mowing time for, for the silage harvest. So it is a little bit of a concern um, under dry conditions, and that's why we would be promoting earlier spreading of the majority of the slurry. There's much more opportunity there to utilize that slurry uh, and also for it to be uh, incorporated or, or infiltrate into the soil under dampish conditions. And yeah, I suppose the, the corollary to that is the trail and shoe better from that uh, perspective. Yes, it would be. It would be. So the trailing shoe actually goes along on the soil surface, gets down below that, that grass uh, where there's a little bit more moisture uh, pat. So uh, the trailing shoe does a better job and doesn't leave it in a wide band, which kind of sits uh, semi on, onto the grass like the like the band spreader, so it, it would be a better a better uh, piece of technology. There's a question here about the contribution of all this uh, to our overall requirement uh, and target to reduce ammonia uh, uh, nationally. Um, we might just comment on on the the targets that we have and and how this can contribute. Okay, so um, in, in terms of the targets, uh, as I've said, our ammonia targets are 1% are reduction up to 2030, but then the big reduction um, uh, is needed. It's a 5% reduction. That's a big challenge because the 5% reduction uh, largely has to be met by agriculture for ammonia. So um, as I've said in my presentation, uh, slurry, and slurry management, be it spreading, storage, or housing, uh, accounts for almost um, three quarters of the ammonia emissions. So again, that's very, very significant that we get better management, um, reduce volatilization, spring spreading, low emission slurry spreading, uh, amending in the houses, uh, covering slurry stores. So those technologies are all there uh, on the cards. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, we have uh, roughly uh, a 10 to 15 percent reduction to meet for agriculture. It's a 30 percent reduction overall for, for nationally, but agriculture's uh, reduction is, is, is our proportion is slightly less in that. Um, nitrogen 
and nitrogen use efficiency is one of the key things here. Um, obviously, we have livestock uh, producing methane, but in terms of the, the nitrous oxide, and the nitrous oxide being the most potent greenhouse gas, 298 times um, CO2, uh, it's really, really important that we uh, manage our nitrogen to maximize the efficiency. That's good for the business as well, because fertilizers represent a, a significant cost variable cost in the business. Um, so these technologies are really, really important there. However, uh, the benefits can only be gotten if uh, a farmer is doing a fertilizer plan based on soil samples. Um, the NNP online system is there nationally for, for private and public advisors uh, to use. And that will tailor the plan where there can be economies made in terms of the bagged fertilizer, the chemical fertilizer, where we don't get the savings with the, with the low emission story spreading and then put on the same amount of chemical fertilizer. That's going to be an inefficiency. So we need, to, we need to maximize the benefit in terms of what we keep on the ground and then reduce our chemical fertilizer, our, our, our inputs. Uh, another question there, is there trial work, uh, we mentioned biochar, but is there uh, data or trial work done on addition of, of other uh, amendments and what kind of results are you getting from those? Okay, so we currently have a couple of studies. Sorry? That was just yeah. a little bit of feedback there. Go yeah. ahead, David. So, so we currently have a number of studies looking at a, a range of, of different amendments. Um, obviously, lime and, and the, the, the conventional amendments are, are in there. Uh, different types of manures, slurries and wastes are, are also in there. And then uh, some industry byproducts. So we have a, um, a gypsum type product uh, coming from the dairy industry. So it's, um, it's a way of per permeate that's uh, been turned into a, a, a calcium sulfate supply, uh, supplies both calcium and sulfur, but also has soil conditioning properties. So um, looking at organic matter amendments, looking at uh, different soil conditioners in terms of limes, etc is something that we are uh, engaged in at the, at the, at the moment. Uh, those results are not fully available yet. We don't have a full year study. Uh, they're in train at the moment. But we hope to disseminate some of that work through uh, Mark and colleagues, through the advisory service um, early next year in terms of what's going on. But they, they are really important in terms of preserving soil quality, enhancing nutrient retention and nutrient supply. And given that uh, we have heavier, heavier pressures on some farms in terms of stocking density and heavier machinery coming in with contractors, et cetera, protecting the soil and soil structure uh, is going to be really important and the amendments play a, a major role there. Mark, uh, we're in the, the month of May, we're in the middle of May now. Um, what can farmers do now? What actions can they t start taking this week, what decisions can they start making to uh, improve the efficiency of their, their slurry? Um, and is it working with their, 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 their contractors? Well, I suppose, Mark, look, I suppose uh, first good silage is going to be, be, be cut as, as we speak or will be cut in, in the next uh, number of days or, or weeks. So again, I suppose it's the plan for that. Um, I suppose look at maybe getting a contractor with a, a low emission slurry spreader, some like a training shoe. And I suppose pick your days and your and your and your conditions. Um, as they can get some moisture. Hopefully we get rain in in the next you know ten days of fortnight. And you know you know try to get slurry out. Look at fertilizer plant. See which fields. Um, you know see what's needed there. Um, on those fields to to you know get the slurry out. Get tanks cleaned out. Um, you know. You know, over the coming over the coming weeks and months, in conditions all important as well. Um, yeah, I suppose that, that's the main thing from a, a slurry point of view, um, Mark. Uh, but the, the the reality is that if you're booking a contractor, you're not always going to get them on on the day that presents the the ideal conditions, can you? I mean, are there the ways to mitigate that? Or I mean, it's uh, I hear of. Uh, farmers clubbing together to, to buy uh, these uh, trailing shoe machines and stuff like that. I, I don't know, have you come across that? Yeah, that, that, that is happening in different parts of the country where, as you say, farmers are, are working together. They're sharing a machine, and, and that's a 
that's a good arrangement. So again, that gives you more flexibility, um, you know, in terms of, of, of when uh, you can actually go and you can pick, I suppose, better conditions to ensure that the, the nitrogen is, is utilized and the slurry is, is utilized as, as efficiently as possible. So I think definitely we should be trying to move towards either a band spreader or a trailing shoe, uh, you know, type of equipment. And I suppose, you know, get slurry out as, as soon as possible once on silage is cut. I think from speaking to Jack Nolan last week, I think the writing is on the wall in relation to the, uh, the, the splash plate. That it's probably only a matter of time uh, by when that, that will be uh, just not, not permitted any longer at a farm level. Uh, there's a question there, uh, or uh, maybe we're being admonished for not mentioning water quality in relation to uh, slurry spreading. Yeah, so in terms of water quality, we are promoting earlier spring spreading, but earlier spring spreading under optimal soil conditions. So we don't want to be going out when soils are saturated. Uh, we're going to do soil compaction uh, damage and potentially lead to the runoff of nutrients. And if there's a neighboring stream or, 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 or drains or whatever, um, slurry nutrients may be, be transported to, towards those. So um, when we talk about spring application, we're talking um, about uh, the second round um, in, a, in a lot of cases, uh, there may be some slurry going out uh, very early to alleviate uh, issues with, with tanks, but it doesn't all have to be spread at that point. So uh, any time in March, even into early April before silage, silage closing time, those are times of the year where we're going to maximize the benefit. There's a high demand for nutrients as we go into the, the, the onset of the, of the major growing season. Um, and you have weather conditions that are more conducive to reducing losses, even with the splash pit. Now, as the last question went there, is there anything that we can mitigate uh, in terms of the technologies, the low emission slurry spreading, if you are getting a contractor and you can't specify what day he's going to turn up, he or she. So uh, if they turn up on the day when the, 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 the sun is splitting the stone, so to speak, um, the real good day, uh, the low emission slurry spreading technique will help to reduce the emissions on that day regardless of weather conditions and everything else. So um, what I would be saying is if, if your contractor has the option there of a low emission slurry spreading um, and you can't specify the day, that's going to um, maximize your return on um, slurry investment. Okay, we're just coming up to half past 10 now. So I think we'll have to wrap it up. Lots and lots of questions coming through there. Um, what we'll, tr we'll do is we, we will have a copy of all of the questions here that have been submitted and what we'll try and do is pull together some of the key questions that, uh, that we haven't had a chance to, to get through. Um, lots of interesting questions about soil biodiversity and the impact of, of slurry addition and so on. So, and I know there is work going on on that uh, yeah. in, in Chagask as well. So look, I, I think what we'll have to do here is wrap, it, wrap things up. Um, I want to thank uh, Mark Plunkett and uh, David Wall for joining us. David, I know you're, you're not feeling particularly well today, so uh, you're very good to, to, to uh, dig deep for us. Uh, Pat Murphy, thank you for helping us with uh, the questions. Uh, Yvonne Maher and Andy Boland uh, also have been uh, instrumental in making this series happen. Uh, also, thank you to our partners uh, who are supporting the series also. Uh, with that, I uh, just want to thank you for listening and uh, tuning in on a weekly basis. Next week, uh, we will be speaking to you again, David, I think, uh, if that's right. And um, we'll be speaking about, uh, what, what will we be speaking about, David? Protected Urea, isn't it? Protected Urea, and Patrick Forrest, oh, that's right. Patrick yeah. is going to be joining us as well. So looking forward to that presentation. So with that, I uh, wish you a good weekend. And again, the presentations will be available on the Chagas website in the next couple of days and the recording of the uh, video as well will be on the Chagas YouTube channel. So thank you very much. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagas Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review, 
and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.